We can go ahead and do that too. So, hello everyone. My name is Brian, and I am from CoreOS, and I will be walking you through with my dulcet tones about Kubernetes and CoreOS and all that. But first, what we're going to do is I'm going to come clean. I am that guy you've seen on television. And it is true that I love the band Bolt Thrower a lot. In, in Battle There Is No Law. You know, it is one of the greatest albums of the 1980s for anyone who's a fan of crust, heavy metal, or tabletop strategy games like Warhammer. But this is a little bit orthogonal to why everyone actually came into the room. I'm sure one or two people is really psyched. They're like, this guy knows me really well. But getting back to it, I am Brian Redbeard, really just make it Brian Redbeard. It's easier for everybody to remember. There's a whole lot of naming collisions around the name Brian to start with as it is. And here's a bunch of the ways that you can actually stalk me on the internet. So, you know, the most interesting ones are probably uh, GitHub, the ones where I say the most offensive things are on Twitter, and we can just kind of roll with it from there. Uh, so, first I have to ask, is anyone here from DreamHost? Great. Uh, so our marketing team named this talk, I don't actually have anything to do with DreamHost. Um, they have a product called DreamStack. So there was a little bit of uh, confusion between our marketing team and myself when we were actually talking through this. But moving on, the big reason why we are here is to talk about things that go really, really well together. And, you know, for me, peanut butter and jelly is still one of my, my great vices. But um, there, as far as the pieces actually go, you know, they're all easy to consume in small parts. It's how they start to become like combined together in the long run where it really gets fascinating. So the first one, obviously fans are, or obviously folks here are fans of OpenStack. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in the room. You know, it could be that you're ATCs. It could be that you're trying to figure out how to implement it in your organization doesn't really matter. I mean, everybody is kind of clear on like the overall goal of what OpenStack is trying to solve. For a lot of people here, it will be less so as to what CoreOS even actually is. It's kind of my passion project that I, I work on with a bunch of other nut jobs in San Francisco. Um, it's, you know, an open source Linux distro, but it's built to run container workloads from the ground up. Like that is its kind of primary use case uh, as initially considered. And the third piece here, the third, you know, kind of title slide thing that we're actually talking about is Kubernetes. And all of these are just pieces in a larger puzzle of how it all fits together. So we're going to start, since everybody knows kind of the 30,000 foot view of OpenStack, we'll come to that later and we'll you know, pop it back onto the stack and, and make some sense out of it. So let's start with CoreOS. First and foremost, CoreOS is extremely opinionated. It's, as far as Linux distros go, it's, it's opinionated in a way that a lot of folks are not used to. It's opinionated in a way that a lot of folks find unnerving at first. But, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's, uh, you, you learn to love it. Like, there is no frame buffers or text, you know, fancy text editors or modem drivers or Windows managers or interpreted languages, with the exception of Bash. You know, it, there, there's none of that. It really comes down to it is this idea that we are, have really been trying to drive around minimalism in your infrastructure. About, you know, we're driving on this path where things are getting increasingly complex and they need to become increasingly complex in order to have the kind of automatic failover HA type setups that every kind of big organization is actually desiring. But where this actually drives to and one of the first initial linchpins of how it loops back to really being a good fit with OpenStack is that we're trying to drive things uh, via this idea of an API driven infrastructure. So, you know, everyone who wants to use OpenStack at some level is trying to achieve this API-driven infrastructure. You know, it's, it's why, like I said, it makes so much sense for CoreOS to be here. You know, our goal is that in a perfect world, you aren't SSHing into hosts. Like, you, you actually never need to SSH into hosts. In, in really the perfect world, when you spin a worker online to do some type of compute job for you, you don't even put SSH keys on it. 
Now think about that. You, you have this worker where you don't want anyone to even be able to log into it. Because ideally, what you're doing is you're sending telemetry from the box back to some central location so that you can actually do diagnostics and see what's going on with your application, see the health of your servers, get an idea for you know, the amount of users. You know, this is the whole idea of why companies like New Relic are also taking off and why you know, uh, Elastico you know, uh, kind of grabbed Logstash and has been really making the Elk stack a critical part of a lot of companies and why so many other entities like uh, Datadog and these others are, are coming up because they give you easy ways of actually collocating all of the data about your hosts together into a centralized spot that you can work uh, with it and, you know, be more informed about your infrastructure. And in this type of world, nobody needs Vim Enhanced. You, you know, we, we get questions, like yesterday, there was a question on our mailing list. I need to run Nano on my core OS box. Why? Why? Like, yes, I understand it's easier to use than Vim. Personally, I'm a, a, a diehard Vim user. You know, I, I go back to the era where the reason you use Vim is because it fits on a single floppy versus Emacs, and, and that's just the way it happens. But in the type of world that we're trying to drive where nobody needs Vim, they don't need any of this other stuff either. And it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's an easy thing for most folks to kind of step in and go, no, I don't need a frame buffer. The fact that my console that I'm hopefully never going to log into, it's okay that dev TTY1 is, or dev TTY0 is, you know, 24 by 80. Because I'm going to, if I must, SSH into that box, and then SSH is going to handle resizing all that bits. And, you know, it doesn't really make sense to have uh, modem drivers on there because you're never going to hook that device up to it. So CoreOS has been this exercise in stripping things down to the metal and then slowly adding in the pieces that we really just need to have there. And that's something that is challenging for folks to accept. You know, when you've got companies that ship proprietary drivers in order to make their product work, and they're not willing to push those drivers into the upstream kernel, they get chafed a little bit. When you, when you say, well, that's kind of, it, it may not be against the business sense of open source, but it is against the, the spirit of it at the very least. So, uh, it's not to say that you can't do things like load modem drivers or load frame buffers. It's just we don't make it easy. It's not going to be a, a DNF install to push that onto the box. It's not going to be a DPKG-I to get things on there. But, you know, you've, you've listened to me here railing for the better part of a few minutes about all these things that CoreOS is not. Let's actually talk about what is in a CoreOS host. So the, the basics of it is that you're containerizing your applications. Now, in, in my case, that containerization engine ends up being Rocket. There are other folks who use Docker. There are other folks who use, you know, who kind of have these setups to do let me contain that for you and, and other components there. It doesn't really matter. You know, we ship Docker on there, but uh, personally, like I said, I, I use Rocket and it works fantastic. The, the next part, which is where it gets kind of strange, it, it continues down this path of opinionation, is that it's a self-updating operating system. It's not something where your administrators have to go in and, you know, do this patch cycle. You know, it's, it's very much like the Chrome browser or like an Android phone or an iPhone. It, it's something where the service provider, which happens to be us in this case, we package up these updates, we push them out to the hosts, and we do this on a regular cadence. And there's a few reasons for that. Because one of them is, if you get used to this idea that you don't have to log into the host, and that the hosts will go down, and they will come back, and the applications are containerized so they can move around the cluster with a relative amount of ease, then it gets you into this idea that you don't do maintenance at 11 p.m. on a Friday night when your ops guys are angry. And if they're not angry, they will be eventually. That, that resentment of, oh, I have to be sitting here doing this when I could be at home drinking a beer and this is annoying. No, it's, it's the idea that you should be doing maintenance at 11 a.m. on a Monday morning. 
And the reason for that is, is everybody comes in, they've had a chance to check their email, they've, they've had a cup of coffee, they're fresh, and everybody is ready to tackle any problems that come online. And when you get used to this idea that boxes will go down, like that's one of the big like kernels of truth that I think Werner Vogel like shared with the world of really driving it home of everything goes down all the time. And you just have to get used to that. And once you can get used to having that happen and you can get used to designing applications for that state, it becomes easier to keep them online because you loosely couple things and you are able to handle failures differently. And, you know, there is a little bit of paranoia about, well, if you're just going to push updates, well, how do you, how do you handle failure? And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But the other thing that we do is we have a lot of uh, distributed systems tooling that we worked on. Like, at the same time in parallel as beginning the operating system, we realized that if you're going to have a large cluster of machines, you need a strong source of truth across all of those machines. In our case, that's a product called etcd, which I'll talk about in a second. But, you know, we, we put together these other things like Fleet and Flannel and all that. And, you know, it's just, it's a bunch of tools that fit in the white space between the existing gaps. Like, okay, you've got systemd on a box, and you've got Mesos that's handling cluster management across, you know, a large number of hosts. What if you don't need the weight of Mesos? What if you just need a little bit in between? That's kind of the idea of where we're trying to fit with a lot of these, uh, a lot of the individual tools that we're building. So to go back to the failure case on updating the actual operating system, let's say, so you have this uh, kind of peculiar partition scheme where you have your EFI, where uh, your bootloader actually lives, you have a different partition where your kernel actually runs, you have a primary data partition, which is where the state of the actual host lives. Then you have two copies of slash user. Well, if you were to read like the Linux file system hierarchy, you'd, you'd know that the idea of slash user is it's binaries that are shipped by the actual vendor. And if you want to add in anything particular, then you, the, the local kind of entity, you add that to user local, but everything that the vendor ships should be in slash user. And, you know, configuration goes in Etsy and all of that, but the binaries, you know, kind of are their own thing. So we have two copies of this partition, and what happens is, you know, when we boot this host, we're running off of partition A. All the data is sitting on the data partition, and we will stage down this update onto a RAM disk, and we'll uh, go through and do cryptog cryptographic checks. We verify a GPG key, we verify a hash of things, we go through and check that all the metadata actually matches, and that the, the data came from a trusted entity. And then we apply that to the B partition. We reboot. YOLO, we just reboot the thing. And when that box is coming back online, we have a, crust, a custom grub module that checks everything to make sure that everything looks the way that it's supposed to. And if that, uh, the tests on the partition succeed, we just keep going. Everything is set. Continue normal operation. We're just now running from the B partition. And we write this metadata to the actual good partition table on the disk. If for some reason that fails, well, we're set. We can fail back to that known good partition. So we can keep doing this process until things work. Now, obviously, you don't want your boxes just flapping. So, you know, it gives you the opportunity to, through storing that metadata, say, hey, uh, things are going a little weird here. Maybe we should not actually be uh, rebooting that, so we, we actually tag like the last known good, the last failed version, and are able to work through that. But it's through actually storing that uh, on the GPT on the disk that we're able to work through it. But after we've done that, we need to actually have a workload, and that's where it comes into application containers. And as I mentioned, in our case, that's a tool called Rocket. So Rocket is a thing that runs in the foreground, it is designed to be tightly in integrated with System D. Our init system in CoreOS is System D. You know, Rocket was designed to be an implementation of the AppC spec. Uh, AppC spec is something that we started working on back in November of last year, where we said, "Hey, you know, if you're going to have containers and you're going to design these containers, you probably want them to work on different operating systems, not just opinionated ones like CoreOS." <clears throat> 
So having a specification allows you to have different implementations of that specification. And Rocket is just our implementation. The folks over at AppSera have Kerma. Uh, the folks over at um, uh, Three of Coins in Poland actually wrote an AppC implementation that runs Ackies, you know, the, the containers for Rockets on FreeBSD. But instead of using kernel namespaces, they actually utilize uh, free, uh, FreeBSD jails and then uh, uh, ZFS for the underlying graph driver rather than uh, ButterFS or OverlayFS like we do. The next piece that we've got inside of it is etcd. So etcd is a highly available key value store that handles uh, like storing data and gives you kind of semaphores across a network. So now you can actually begin coordinating locks between components of your application regardless of the size of the cluster, regardless of the number of members in the cluster, and regardless of whether a process is sitting on the same host. Now, I want to reiterate that n all of this stuff is open source. All of this stuff gets consumed by things beyond CoreOS as well. etcd is actually the storage engine inside of Kubernetes, which is why I bring it up now. So uh, etcd resides on every single CoreOS host, but it's also the, the source of truth inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, one of the things that was explained by the folks over at Google through their uh, operation of containers for close to a decade now is that it's really important that every container gets its own IP address. Don't try to deal with NAT and like port mapping and all of that. It just makes a giant mess. And after kind of really thinking through that, we put together a tool called Flannel. Flannel is interesting because on top of, you know, etcd being incorporated in uh, uh, Kubernetes, Flannel is actually incorporated into Magnum as well to, to make all these pieces easier. So it, it's, it's interesting because we've built all these tools. We didn't build them necessarily with uh, specific projects in mind beside our own, but we, were, we tried to always be very, very mindful about how we put these pieces together so that they could be consumable by other things upstream. So now we're going to uh, move a little bit over, and we're going to talk about Kubernetes. So you know, this uh, actually came up in the, uh, uh, the Super User magazine. Uh, I apologize to uh, Warden and uh, uh, OpenVZ. Uh, you know, Kier, Kieran folks, you're, you're in my heart. But uh, unfortunately, we had to chop them off of the bottom of the slide there in order to make it fit. But, you know, it kind of illuminates that how the questions in this space are also being a little strangely framed right now. Like, Docker and Kubernetes and LXC and Mesos and Rocket and LexD are all being thrown into the same bucket, but it's not like there's, like, it's not like it's an apples to apples comparison. Like comparing Rocket to Mesos or comparing LexD to uh, Kubernetes is a little bit of a strange comparison because some of these are containerization engines where they actually execute the container. Other ones are orchestrators of the containers. So, you know, uh, Kubernetes and Mesos do similar functionality. They take a container and they schedule it across some control plane or some worker plane of execution to make sure that that container stays online and running. Whereas Docker and LXC and Rocket and LexD all do, uh, uh, they're all container execution engines. But so inside of Kubernetes, the most basic thing that you have is a single container. So in this case, like I was saying, we'll use a Rocket container. The next thing that happens is that in the world of a container, it's run inside of a pod. And a pod is a set of kernel namespaces and an address, and this pod will run on a single host. That is, as far as Kubernetes is truly concerned, the smallest atomic unit that it will ever directly manage. Now, the thing about a pod and why this is different than some of the implementations uh, of what folks are used to with pieces like Docker is that a pod can contain n number of containers. You can just, you can have one container in a pod, you can have 50 containers in a pod. And what will happen is, is they will share all of those same namespaces. So this is really useful if you want to run two processes side by side. 
You know, let's say that you had three containers in this case. You know, I kind of set it up for that. Let's say that you have a worker which transforms information and writes it to a remote location. You know, it's kind of, it's a general API worker. It grabs some piece of data and does something with it. You have a process which also watches the worker and sends logs related to that to a remote location. You know, especially if you've been writing things using like Unicorn to be able to like fire these off. You know, you begin to hit a point where running a single process in a single container doesn't make sense. But it doesn't mean that you start putting init systems into your container because that doesn't entirely make sense as well. At that point, you're beginning to just create virtual machines. And virtual machines have their place. And virtual machines, I, I don't want to make it sound like virtual machines versus containers. Like they have their purposes, and they provide different benefits. And I don't even want to go so far as to say that performance is really one of those, because that's a little bit of a straw man argument. You tune things right, and you know, play some games, and you can get uh, VMs that are just as performant as your containers. But let's say that we then have this third process, which is just, it's running some job on a regular interval. It's a cleanup process, which purges old logs and you know, makes things happy. So all three of these processes will run inside the same PID namespace, the same UTS namespace, the same IPC namespace, the same network namespace. And because they've got that, they're all in that same network namespace, they're all going to share a single IP address, or whatever IP addresses are actually assigned to the pod. So once we have a pod in place, Pods are instantiated by the idea of a replication controller. And a replication controller is a reconciler that says, what is the state? What is the desired state? You, you can think of it like what Puppet is doing. It's what is the configuration on this box? What is the desired configuration on this box? In this case, our replication count is one. But we can also say across our entire worker system, replication count becomes three. And it will stamp out three copies of that same set, that same pod, that same set of containers that are all running together across the entire worker plane. And you can just keep going. That's the basic idea. The next piece, kind of moving across the stack, is you need to be able to get to these. And that is where you have a service in Kubernetes. So that, that becomes, in this case, you'll have the service is, has an IP address configured on it. The service is the IP address that will be reachable by a load balancer. It's, it's the desirable thing that you want to expose to the outside world. And you, you know, uh, an end user would never directly hit a pod. But there's some problems with this. And there's some problems with this, which OpenStack is already poised to solve. And that's why I wanted to talk about OpenStack kind of after these, after we had a foundation of kind of understanding what the various pieces are. So obviously, you know, if, if you've, you need some place to run these, and the, the most obvious choice is that you, you're going to use Nova. I mean, that's, that's a given. You're going to use Nova to actually instantiate VMs, likely, to handle the machine workloads of the components of Kubernetes. But when you are designing things to run inside of a container, there's a, there's a few kind of anti-patterns that you should avoid. One, you shouldn't actually be storing files in the container. The container should be ephemeral. Think of this as going back to the original ideas of, of the like early OpenStack days. You're not using OpenStack to spin up these long-running machines. You spin up a machine, you tear it down. You spin up a machine, you tear it down. It should be ephemeral. Containers are the same way. If you need to save the state of something, if you need to save files, that should be placed outside of the container. Unfortunately, we've already got something to do that. Now, that means that your applications actually need to know how to talk to an object store. They need to be able to take their files and say, OK, I've retrieved this asset. I'm going to do some work with it. I'm now done. I need to commit it back. So Swift allows us to handle that. And, and you know, you, you take this the next step beyond. You go, well, if you're not supposed to store files in a container, that's going to make it really, really hard to handle like persistence. And not just file persistence, but database persistence. Fortunately, this is a problem that's also been solved, mostly solved pretty good. You use Trove. Trove is the database as a service component. Trove is the thing that now lets you make the API call to say, hey, I need 
a MySQL database. Please bring that online for me. It's not the only answer to this. It's the answer that OpenStack provides today. Now, this could also be that if you didn't need that, if you wanted something more like CockroachDB or Rethink or one of those, you can just run it directly inside of Kubernetes because in that case, the database software itself is going to replicate the individual files to all of the containers that will be running them. So when a container goes offline, it's not that big of a deal because you've got additional copies of it that can handle that workload. Trove is really for the older applications, the, the applications like WordPress. I love picking on WordPress, partially because I've used it so much, but also because people really understand it. If you break apart what WordPress actually is, it's a PHP application that needs to store things in a database and needs to store files on a disk. And that was never designed for this era of compute workloads. Open source software is still catching up to this idea that we need to design applications in a new way. I mean, that, that's evinced by the fact that if you look at a lot of examples of containers today, you go to instantiate them, and it's a gigabyte worth of stuff. You know, it's pulling in Ubuntu and then doing app get installs of software, which you know, I, I think that that's extremely valuable as a learning exercise or an initial development exercise. But in the, the long run, we need to get to a point where we understand the pieces of software that we are shipping better so that we understand the dependencies and can limit that down. Now, no amount of, well, obviously, if you've got these containers running all over a control plane, you need to actually be able to get to them. And that is where the load balancers of service through Neutron comes in. Because now you can make these API calls to say, I've brought up a new pod, or I've brought up a new uh, copy of a service over here. I need to be able to route components to that. Uh, make this API call to point your, uh, to add me to a member of that pool. And then things get a little weird. And this is one of the things that I'm really stoked on. Um, Devananda and folks, uh, you know, Devananda from HP and uh, Russell and Jay and Paul and a bunch of folks uh, at Rackspace and formerly of Rackspace did a lot of work on Ironic. Uh, the, the Rackspace implementation in its commercial form uh, is called On Metal. The idea of it is that you use the Nova APIs to provision an actual physical machine for by minute usage. And they actually used CoreOS inside of this to make this happen. So what this means is that using Ironic now, you don't even need to be sequestered to virtual machines. You can actually bring these components. You can bring the CoreOS host online itself to be able to then run Kubernetes inside of a container on top of that. And it kind of goes turtles all the way down. But when it comes to Ironic, it becomes interesting because CoreOS runs in RAM so they run CoreOS in RAM, they pull in the remote API, and uh, they, they pull in the uh, API worker that can talk to Nova, and then on the back end, they go through and set up the like, Pixie configurations and how to actually talk to the BMC or the IPMI on the box and be able to control it from there. But this is kind of how all of this starts to look in practice. You have some set of Kubernetes uh, nodes that you designate as controllers, and you have some set of Kubernetes nodes that you designate as workers. And then you handle uh, the sharing of information throughout all of these uh, through components like uh, the load balancers of service in Neutron and, and Trove and Swift. And I, I differentiate these in colors more because there is some other problems today in Kubernetes. And they're being solved. You know, we, we at CoreOS actually have a solution that works for us, but doesn't work for everyone else, which is why you know, we do it. But um, in this case, the, the nodes in red up at the top, those are your unicorns. The ones down in blue, those are your robots. Robots are easy to crush and remanufacture and redestroy. But if somebody kills your unicorn, you are really bummed. This is the idea of, you know, uh, pets versus cattle. But, you know, there's the realization that some people really get kind of bummed out when you talk about killing Fido or wholesale slaughter of cattle. I prefer unicorns and robots. When that unicorn sheds its single tear, you break off its horn and then use that to 
power up new portions of your infrastructure, you can gain its power, but uh, it's going to be <laughs> a little bit of a bad time for a little bit. Um, now, all of this may seem familiar to folks who have been going to some of the other talks here. It's like, well, this sounds a lot like Magnum. In a way it is, but it's, it's not Magnum. And, and there's, there's a specific few reasons why here. Um, you know, Magnum uses Kubernetes, but it, instead of just being instantiated directly as containers on top of a box, it leverages other orchestration mechanisms or like the application packaging of Murano to be able to schedule that throughout the entire cluster. Um, so it means that it, it, you're going to be able to run it on things beyond CoreOS, which is obviously the goal of, of Adrian working on that. But, you know, that it's, it gives you more flexibility, but it's going to add in additional layers. You're going to have to have someone curating that heat template for your image, for your chosen operating system, for your version of Kubernetes. You know, having, that, that's where personally, just because I'm closer and, you know, obviously aligned with a specific distro, I've identified how some of those pieces can be mo removed out of the stack and how you can solve them. But at the same time, Magnum does use other pieces. Like I mentioned before, we've got, uh, you know, the core OS pieces like Flannel that are involved as well. So Flannel's giving you that overlay network. You know, like the, the easiest way to think of Flannel for folks who are not familiar with it is I can say for folks who aren't familiar with Flannel but are familiar with Docker, Flannel is giving you a Docker Zero, that Docker Zero bridge across all of your workers. It means that now a worker or a, a container with an arbitrary IP address on one node can talk to a different container with an arbitrary IP address on a different node. It, it uses this overlay network to be able to do the communications actually between them. Um, so it, it's fascinating seeing how these pieces can be composed in lots of different ways like Legos to actually uh, put together the system the way that you want to do it. And that's been the exciting part to me. So, you know, I've been talking for a little, just about 35 minutes, a little short of that. This was scheduled for 40. And I wanted to make sure that we had questions or time for questions from folks. And we've still got that moment where everybody's lined up at, or near the microphone. So hopefully that means that uh, folks will have some things there. So uh, all of this kind of gets put together in, um, I, myself and uh, another choreo, as we call ourselves, is working on it. This is actually BC Walden, uh, who is the former PTL of Glance. So, you know, we, we've got some kind of ties even back into this. Um, he, he doesn't really like having my beard rubbing on his shoulder, but, you know, he, he can suffer through that. So at this point, I'm just going to leave that slide awkwardly up. <laughs> and we'll take some questions. So if folks want to direct themselves over to the mics, uh, or, or Mike, it appears, uh, we can do that. Uh, I'm sure that folks at least are a little bit curious about this stuff. Um, you know, I have uh, some other things here that I can kind of show off as well that are just give you a little bit more view into Kubernetes itself, the idea of how you instantiate and remove pods, how you build the service controllers and, and all that, but... So the question was, what is the timeline on my beard? Um, it, it's, it's actually funny because I was in the shower this morning. I was thinking, I need to just actually put together the, the frequently asked questions section on my website because here's how this normally goes. Hey, uh, excuse me, I got a question for you. 14 months. What? Wh what? You were about to ask how long I've been growing my beard. That's, at the moment, it's 14 months. Now, the question, or the, the photo back at the beginning where my beard was down to there, it was actually four years. I got tired of all the Duck Dynasty comments and shaved it off. The, the beard is actually the same length of time that I've been working at CoreOS. So there's two major CoreOS epics, May 3rd, or uh, March 3rd, uh, 2014, which is when this beard started growing. And then also, funny enough, uh, July 1st, 2013. 
So for anyone who uses CoreOS, you'll notice that we have this semantic versioning of our actual images. So you'll see that there's version 512, then there's version 638. That first digit is the number of days since the initial CoreOS epoch. So it's, you know, you can look at it and go, okay, this image came out 638 days after July 1st. You know, this other one came out 681 days. And then we kind of bump them from there. But the, uh, in CoreOS, we have three, because we're doing this auto update process, we have three major channels. There's an alpha, there's a beta, and there's a stable. Every image that becomes a stable has been through both beta and alpha. You know, we make sure that everything gets tested that way. Uh, the cadence is roughly that a CoreOS image gets released to alpha once a week, roughly to beta once every two weeks, and roughly to stable once a month. Another question. Wow, I have failed. If I, I either I'm it, either one, it feels good to be that good that just nobody has any questions or uh, yes. Yes. So the question was, given that uh, I explained that there was the load balancers of service through Neutron, and then that Kubernetes services are exposed on individual CoreOS hosts, how do we actually expand the size of the cluster and handle that? Was how do, how do we handle like the IP addresses of all the nodes? So uh, in the case of Kubernetes, individual, uh, the, uh, the way that we're doing it on CoreOS, individual workers will proxy traffic to wherever that uh, uh, worker actually happens to be. Uh, Kubernetes uses this idea of label queries inside of it. So you can say that uh, all traffic coming inbound to this IP address will get redirected to all pods that have the you know, a specific label that you specify. Um, so what actually happens there is because you can have multiple containers in a single uh, pod, you can actually schedule components there that say, hey, when this pod comes online, it should actually make an update to uh, Neutron for me to say, bring this component in place. Now that also means that you do need to schedule uh, a set of IP addresses up front that uh, are kind of in the pool available for uh, uh, the load balancers of service, similar to how you'd have fixed IPs for Neutron. Yes, I definitely, so uh, in the case, the question was, do we see that this is a core change inside of Kubernetes to be able to handle OpenStack? And one of the things that they've been doing is a lot of work around specifically making external load balancers work as a first class citizen. So it, for us at CoreOS, it has meant that uh, having the components like that that can make an update directly to the external load balancer on behalf means that the containers don't need to worry about that. It's not there today, but it will be landing relatively soon. They're actually completely, uh, they're in discussions to revamp how the external load balancers work inside of Kubernetes. So it's something that we're hoping is going to be finished for 1.0, but it's still a little bit undecided. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the pull request or the issues actually discussing it, but because um, they've got concerns where they want to be able to, so today they can just do that type of update to Google's uh, load balancer as a service. Uh, there's other folks working on the Amazon one and still other folks working on the updates to Neutron. So it's definitely the idea is going to be supported. It's just not quite there yet. Yes, question in the back. Uh, maybe a little bit further to the question about uh, LBS as a service. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for the benefit of folks who are watching at home, I'm going to try to repeat that. I definitely have an answer, but so the question was, in the case of Docker Zero, uh, or the case of Flannel being used with Neutron, um, 
it Flannel expects to be able to manage some of that IP addressing rather than how Neutron would traditionally do it. So how do we actually handle that when you could have multiple containers coming up at the exact same time, potentially trying to have the exact same IP address? Was that a good summary of it? Okay, yeah, and today that works with how Docker uh, looks at the existing host routes to figure out how to choose an IP address. So what Flannel actually does is it, you would route a larger subnet to the entire cluster, and then uh, what will happen is, since Flannel is an overlay network, it can totally operate where it's working with just with RFC 1918 addresses that aren't available outside of the cluster. So you have that bridge at the worker level that then acts as a proxy getting into Flannel and then can route it to the right place. But because you actually assign like a slash 24 or a slash 23 to each individual host, it means that you'll never have an IP conflict because the routing actually occurs at a different level. Now, in the case of Kubernetes, there's a uh, competing project to Flannel called Calico, which actually does this implementation through IBGP. So they actually manage each route to each container as a slash 32 route, and they redirect the routes using IBGP uh, to give you more of like the IP address could be on any host at any given time. And Flannel, or uh, sorry, Calico actually uses etcd as well to give you that central, central source of truth. So the idea is as soon as I request an IP address from the pool that etcd is managing, that etcd has that on, everything that's reading it immediately sees that it's been kind of knocked out of, or that it's in use. So it gives you the ability to really lock it down and get an atomic point in time for making a request. Uh, that's the exact idea of how etcd can be used as a semaphore. So it looks like we've got time for maybe one more question. Uh, otherwise, I will go ahead and you'll, okay, so we've got one last question here. Yes, so the question was, does Kubernetes have an inventory of the known VMs at any given time? The one thing I'll say is it's not, it doesn't have an inventory of VMs specifically, it has an inventory of the machines involved because it's not specific to virtualization. So, you know, it just cares about who is a worker, but it, it knows all of the individual workers who can service requests. It also keeps a complete inventory of all of the running pods on every single one of those workers and all of the services that are routing request to each one of the pods. And if you grab me afterwards, I can actually show you some pretty good visualizations of it. Do you have a workshop? Yes, so tomorrow, the question was, do we have a workshop? And then tomorrow we are doing an entire kind of development day type thing uh, via the community days where from I believe 1.30 to 6, uh, with a little bit of a break in the middle, uh, we're gonna be doing uh, kind of development assistance and getting started around uh, all of the various components that we've been talking here. etcd, Rocket, uh, Kubernetes, all the above. Um, so if you take a look at the schedule, you'll be able to uh, see where that's actually being done. Um, so at this point I say thank you very much for your time and feel free to grab me if you've got more questions.